Praise the Lord, uh, Apostolic Church of God family. It's a wonderful time to gather together for Wednesday night Bible study. And we do honor God for his goodness and mercy and grace. And we certainly celebrate our pastor, Dr. Byron Brazier in his absence, as well as our first lady, Evangelist Mary Brazier. And we're just ga glad to get together to have this wonderful time of partaking of God's holy word. The Bible lets us know that man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that cometh forth out of the mouth of God. So if you're hungry for the word, type in the comment section, let's eat. Father, we come today to thank you, to praise you, and to honor you for all that you have done. We thank you for your power in our lives. and We thank you for your presence in our walk with you. We thank you for the word which you have given us, which is spirit and life, and able to build us up and give us an inheritance among them that are sanctified. So we pray now on tonight that you bless us as we seek to eat of your holy word. Feed us until we want no more. Help us to come in where the table is spread and the feast of the Lord is going on. Open up our hearts and minds that we may receive your word, and we pray for the anointing that destroys the yoke, and we'll give your name the honor, glory, and the praise. In Jesus' name, amen. Uh, be sure to uh, share this on your timeline so that those who may have forgot tonight was Wednesday night Bible study because of the holidays, that they too can pull up a chair and feast with us on this evening. And I'm so happy to see Teresa and Antoinette and Mary and Kenneth and Mamie and Sharon and Anna and Vincent and all of you who are giving God praise on Facebook and on YouTube and other platforms. And tonight, I wanna talk about conviction in affliction. Conviction in affliction. David C. Gibbs Jr. of the Christian Law Association states, and I quote, a preference is a strong belief, but a belief that you will change under the right circumstances. Circumstances such as one, peer pressure. If your beliefs are such that other people stand with you before you will stand, your beliefs are preferences, not convictions. Number two, family pressure. Number three, lawsuits. Number four, jail. Number five, threat of death. Would you die for your beliefs? A conviction, on the other hand, is a belief that you will not change. Why? A man believes that his God requires it of him. Preferences are protected by the Constitution, but convictions are. A conviction is not something that you discover, it is something that you purpose in your heart. Convictions on the inside will always show up on the outside. In a person's lifestyle, to violate a conviction would be a sin. During this time of unprecedented social upheaval, is your belief in the truthfulness and the trustworthiness of the scriptures a preference or a conviction? When you consider the word of God and the definition given to us by David C. Gibbs Jr. of the distinction between preference and conviction, is your confidence in the trustworthiness of the word of God and the truthfulness of the word of God a preference or a belief? In Psalm 119, which we will be studying tonight, so if you want to grab your Bibles uh, and turn to Psalm 119, or if you have your phone or tablet or uh, electronic device, your laptop computer, we're going to look at Psalm 119. We're going to read verses 105 through 112. But in Psalm 119, and they're going to pull up something for you, we find an anonymous author who boldly declares his conviction of the truthfulness and trustworthiness of God's word, despite the afflictions he was experiencing. So we're going to see what conviction in affliction looks like 
in those verses in Psalm 119 that we will read tonight, but the entire chapter, uh, it was not a chapter, it's a psalm, but the entire psalm is conviction in a time of affliction. Now, when we look at Psalm 119, it is the longest psalm in the Psalter. The 150 psalms, Psalm 119 is the longest psalm. It consists of 22 eight-verse stanzas, which are organized in alphabetical order. Each verse of each stanza begins with the same letter. Now, what I've posted for you in this PowerPoint, if you see the white box with the letters that you can't read, and don't worry about it, I can't read it either, uh, not, not too well anyway, uh, but you will see that 105 to 112, it looks like a right bracket, and I put a green box around all of those. That is the letter noon, or what we would translate as the letter N. So you can see that all eight of those verses begin with the letter noon because he is using creativity and he goes through the entire alphabet of the Hebrew language and he does this from alpha all the way to the end of the Hebrew alphabet in eight verses at a time they all begin poetically with the same letter. In this psalm the author seeks to celebrate the beauty of God's word and the blessing it is to those who live according to it. So he uses that poetic structure in order to highlight the beauty of God's word to us and how it is a blessing in our life. So on tonight, we got some work to do. We got some digging and excavation. We will look at five ways we maintain our conviction during times of affliction five ways we maintain our conviction during times of affliction number one we must be guided by the Word of God we must be guided by the Word of God Psalm 119 105 says thy word is a lamp unto my feet and a light to my path. As a lamp, God's word helps us to see where we are, our present. See, a lamp was for the house. It was not intended for you to see long distances, but you would use a lamp inside your house. And so the psalmist says that the word of God is a lamp for his feet. Now, if you like me, you'd be happy to have that lamp after you hit your toe against the uh, counter or a TV stand or the door hinge. You would be looking for that lamp. And so he says, God, when, when I have your word, when I'm going through a season of tests and trials, your word shines a light in my immediate vicinity. It prevents me from harming myself because it lets me know where I am. And so when I'm going through an affliction, the primary thing I need in my life is the word of God in order to show me my environment, to help me understand and become cognizant of my surroundings because I don't want to stub my toe. I, I don't want to walk into the wrong thing. And so when I have God's word examining my present situation to let me know where I am, how I need to navigate and what I need to do to continue to make progress in the midst of all that I'm going through, then I will be like the psalmist and say, your word is a lamp unto my feet. My feet take me where I need to go. And so if my feet can't move forward in confidence, then how can I navigate the afflictions of life, the trials of life, the troubles of life without a guide to help me find my way? As a light, because he doesn't stop there with the lamp. He says, your word is also a light unto my path. God's word helps us to see, watch this, where we are going, our future. 
So it's a lamp in my immediate vicinity, but it is a light for where I need to get to. And in that day and age, you didn't use a lamp when you were trying to go down a path because the wind could blow uh, the, the lamp out, uh, the stuff would be dripping everywhere, so you would use a torch. And a torch gave you greater capacity. It ha allowed you to see further down the path because you not only want to know what's around you, but you also want to know what's ahead of you. And so God's word allows me to see into the future. He allows me to see the pitfalls and the troubles and the haters that are hiding, waiting for me to get down the road. And so he helps me move successfully and unencumbered into a place of greater. And so as I am negotiating this affliction that I find myself in, I can celebrate with the psalmist, and I feel it now, that God's word is working where I am, and God's word is working where I'm going to be. So he's got me covered in the present, and he has me covered in the future. Somebody shout amen. Sister Belinda. Not only, number one, must we be guided by God's word, but number two, we must commit to live out God's word. We must commit to live out God's word. Let's look at verse 106, Psalm 119, for those of you who are just joining us. I have sworn, and I will perform it, that I will keep thy righteous judgments. Our commitment comes from a recognition of God's character. We must commit to live out God's word because our commitment comes from a recognition of God's character. The psalmist swore an oath to keep God's righteous judgments. He, he says, Lord, that, that not only is your word going to guide me, but I'm going to commit to your word because your word is righteous. He, he swears an oath to God. To swear in the Old Testament was to give one sacred, unbreakable word in testimony that the one swearing would faithfully perform some promised deed or that he would faithfully refrain from some evil act. So when you swear an oath, what you are saying to God is, I vow to do something or not to do something. I vow to do something that is good or I vow not to do something that is bad. And so he says, Lord, I am vowing to you. I am making a pledge to you. I am making a promise to you that I'm going to keep your righteous judgments. Notice the psalmist is acknowledging that God's requirements of his people are morally and ethically upright because God is the righteous judge. His judgments, his rulings, he's, he's bringing us into a courtroom setting now and he's saying, God, whatever you judge is morally and ethically upright. There is no sin. There is no miscarriage of justice in your judgments. And so I can vow to keep them because I know that they're going to be for my good. Whenever God gives a judgment, i.e. his word, what he prescribes for us to do or not do, it's always in our best interest. Even if we minimize it and boil it down to the one judgment he gave to Adam in the Garden of Eden when he said, do not eat from the fruit of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. He only had one judgment to keep and he violated that because he got, thought God was denying him something, but in reality, God was trying to protect him. And so the psalmist says, I'm already going through this affliction. It's not caused by me. It, it's caused by people who are haters trying to stop me from apprehending all that you have for me. But in the midst of what they are doing and in the midst of what I am going through, I make a promise to you. I, I make a vow to you that I'm going to keep your righteous judgments because I know your character. 
I know your nature. And if you have commanded it in your word, then it's for my good. If you have instructed it to me through your holy scriptures, then it means that you are bringing me into something good or you are protecting me from something bad, but either side of the equation, they are still upright. And so I'm going to align my will to your word and I'm making you a promise. Therefore, the psalmist had no problem keeping God's requirement. To keep expresses the careful attention to be paid to the obligation of a covenant to laws, to statutes, and so forth and so on. In other words, it's not just enough for me to make a vow, to say I'm going to do it, but now there is some things, are some things that I need to put in place that prepare me in order to uphold my end of my responsibility. Uh, in other words, if I tell you that I'm going to pick you up at noon, and I say, I promise I'm going to be there at noon, but you call me at 1130 and I'm still in the bed sleep. I haven't made preparations to come pick you up. And so if I say I'm going to pick you up at noon, then by 1130, I should have got out of the bed, had my breakfast, showered, put on my clothes and been out of the door so that when you call me and say, hey, Isaac, I'm just checking to see if you're going to make it on time. I can tell you I've made all of the preparations. And so when I vow to God, I feel it, that I'm going to uphold your holy law I have to ask myself, what am I doing, Sister Rita, that is preparing me to keep my vow? Am I fasting to put my flesh into subjection? Am I reading God's word to feed my mind, the mind of Jesus? Am I praying to have communion and fellowship with God? Am I gathering with the people of God, not just on social media, but in person because I need social, physical, human interaction with people who think like me, who believe like me, who worship like me so that we can encourage one another and as Paul says, impart some spiritual fruit unto each other. And so you can make a vow all you want, but if you are not putting the protocols in place, the controls in place that aid and assist our ability to keep our vows, we're only setting ourselves up to break our vow to God. Our commitment then is ratified by corresponding actions. Let's, let's go back to verse 106. If you pull it up there for me, because I want, I want to show them what's going on here. He says that I have sworn and I will perform it, that I will keep thy righteous judgments. Here's what I want you to do, because he inserts the words in between the commas and it kind of throws it off. So we're going to reread it as it should be. I have sworn that I will keep thy righteous judgments. Watch this. And I will perform it. So, so what he does, though, is when he makes the vow, he moves the sentence structure forward in order to put an emphasis that I'm going to do this. I'm not just making you a promise, but I've swore and I'm going to do it. He didn't even say to God what he was going to do. He just said, I swear I'm going to do it. I'm going to keep your vows. Oh, you missed that. See, he says, before I tell you what I'm going to do and what I'm promising to do, I just want you to know I swear and I'm going to do it. Well, what are you going to do, psalmist? I'm going to keep your righteous judgments. The psalmist was going to take actions to demonstrate his commitment to keeping his vow. That word perform in many instances refers to preparatory activity. That, that's the stuff that you're going to have to do. You know, sometimes I, I try to cook, you know, pray for the poor wife at home. Sometimes I try to cook and it, it probably take me two hours just to prep everything before I attempt to cook it. 
And so I got my recipe out there and it's saying take a whole onion of this and cut up three uh, garlics of that. And I got all this stuff and Lord knows it takes forever just to get the stuff prepared. I got 15 paper plates everywhere because I don't know how quickly I'm be able to throw the onions in and the peppers in and the mushrooms in. So I got stuff everywhere so that I can make sure I throw it in on time. So when it's time for me to cook, everything is in place. And what God is saying to you is that you've made a vow in your affliction. Lord, if you get me out of this, I will do X, Y, Z. The question you must ask yourself tonight is, what preparations are you making to keep your vow? Number three, we must appeal to God from his word. We must appeal to God from his word. 107 and 108. I am afflicted very much. Quicken me, O Lord, according unto thy word. Accept, I beseech thee, the free will offerings of my mouth, O Lord, and teach me thy judgments. We pray from our condition. He says, I am afflicted very much. I'm afflicted. I'm going through some things right now. The psalmist is in a state of severe affliction. Like many of us, tonight, that's really our cry. That, that's our appeal to God is that Lord is rough, is hard on me. I, I've, I've gone through two years of craziness, two years of upheaval, two years of losing loved ones, two years of not being able to see people that I was close with, two years of living in fear of my life, of getting on public transportation, of driving, on the highway of stopping at a stoplight and somebody's walking toward my car. Two years of insanity and my mind and my soul and my spirit is in upheaval, in difficulty, in struggle. It's, it's not just an ordinary affliction because I can handle that, but he says very much afflicted. To be afflicted means to suffer or be oppressed. And some of us tonight, we're, we're suffering illnesses in our body, we're suffering uh, hardship in our finances, we're suffering issues in our marriages because we uh, you know, can't tell our husband to go out the house or you know, tell our wife I'll be back uh, in a couple of hours because I'm going to hang out with brother so-and-so. And so pressure has been put on the family because you're trying to do your job and help your kids do their homework and cook dinner and keep everybody safe from COVID. We, we have these pressures because our jobs are demanding more of us. It seems like we're working harder at home than we were working when we were at the job. There, there are more demands. We, we're afraid that if the economy doesn't get better, we may find ourselves in the unemployment line. So we have all of these pressures going on. Who got COVID? There's a cough, there's a sneeze, I got a headache, do I have it? I don't wanna to go to the hospital because I might catch it there. All of these pressures of oppression, the enemy with his thumb on our necks, pressing and squeezing us and trying to bend us into submission to fear and to doubting the word of God. So now in this place of Christianity, we have those who are doing what they call deconstruction. They, they are reconsidering their faith. They, they are reevaluating what they believe because of the affliction that has taken all of society. That's why we're maintaining our conviction and affliction because people are drifting away from the faith. 
People who had this Santa Claus fairy tale understanding of what it meant to be in relationship with God, who clearly have not read the story of Job, who have not read the story of Abraham, who have not read the story of Jacob, who have not read the story of Joseph. If you just read the Bible, you will see that anybody who is in a relationship with God is going to experience affliction. And so my faith shouldn't be disturbed because I'm going through. My faith shouldn't be di disturbed and rattled because of some hardship. But my faith has to be anchored in the Lord. And so some of the affliction here, here's what he was going through. And it's just a little bit. You can read all of Psalm 119 at your leisure. But he said he experienced the afflictions of princes speaking against him, verse 23. His soul was exhausted from weeping, verse 28. The proud mocked him excessively, verse 51. The cords of the wicked surrounded him, verse 61. The proud lied on him and denied him justice, verse 78. So, so that's just a snapshot of what he was going through. That he was crying un controllably. He had to watch people mistreat him and he could do nothing about it. He, he watched those who were in authority and in power speak down against him. It says, he actually says, they sat together and spoke against me. They, they conspired, they plotted, they organized and strategized to take me out, Lord. And that's why I'm appealing to you. That's why I'm crying out to you because not only do I pray for my condition, but I cannot be weary in the condition. Watch this, because what the enemy wants me to do in a condition of affliction is turn my back away from God. What the enemy wants me to do is to throw in the towel and give up on God. But the psalmist says, I am appealing to you. I am crying out to you from my condition because we pray to God for my condition and we pray to God for intervention. See, I, I'm not going to bail out is what the psalmist says. I, I, I'm not going to deconstruct my faith and try to see whether or not I think the Bible is true and trustworthy, he says, I need some help. If anybody's going to get me out of this situation, it will be the Lord. And so the psalmist appeals to God for three levels of intervention. Number one, he appeals to God to revive him or keep him alive as God promised. He says, quicken me. To quicken means to revive. It, it means to bring back. It means to resuscitate. He's saying, God, I, I'm struggling in this. I, I, I love you. I praise you unconditionally. But, but this is rough. I'm beat down. I'm wore down. I show enough tide. And I need you to quicken me. Now, now I, I, he, he didn't say take me out of this. Oh, that's good. He, he didn't say, Carla, that Lord, get me out. He just says, give me strength in the midst of it. Because I don't know what you're working in this, because in another part of the psalm, he says, it was good that I was afflicted. Because then I learned, then I understood God teaches me something in the midst of my suffering. God teaches me suffering, something in the midst of my oppression, that you can oppress me but not destroy me because the God I serve is greater than the enemy that's outside me. So you can kick me, you can punch me, you can push me, but you cannot destroy me. And so the affliction that I'm going through, I just need strength because he gives strength to the weary and to them who have no might, he increases strength. All I need is a booster shot in my spirit in order to build up my immunity to not quit because if the affliction is designed to cause me to quit, then I need to go to God for a booster in order to invigorate my spirit so that I can continue to stay in the affliction while I give God the glory and the honor. Willem Van Gemmeren says, 
uh, that the word, which is the Hebrew word debar, but he says the word is a most general designation for divine revelation, whether of expectation or promise. Uh, in other words, what uh, Van Gemmeren is saying is that the word of God in its most general designation is a revelation from God. It is God making something known to me, whether he's making known to me something to increase my expectation or he's making something known to me about a promise that he has given to his children. So whether it is an expectation that I'm looking forward to or it is a promise that I am holding on to, as long as God blesses me according to his word and revives me by giving me a hope, revives me by reminding me of his promise, then I can in Endure whatever the enemy throws in my way. Number two, he says in this prayer for intervention, he asked God to receive the prayers and praises of his mouth. And see, this is what I like. I love this. He says, Lord, receive the free will offering of my praise. I, I'm going through. But what I'm going through cannot stop my praise. I, I'm in an afflicted place. I'm being oppressed by people who don't like me, but they can't stop me from praying, nor can they stop me from praising. Oh, that's good stuff. You ought to top that. I'm going to keep praying and I'm going to keep praising right in the devil's face, right in my haters' face. Because notice what typically happens when you're going through affliction, you don't want to pray. The last thing we think to do is pray because we're mad at God. We, we feel betrayed. We feel bamboozled because the preachers and the teachers and the prophets have convinced us that we're not going to experience hardship, even though Jesus himself read letters, said in this world you will have tribulation. So Jesus told us up front that we were going to go through some stuff. So why are we surprised? But because we're in our feelings, we, oh, I'm not going to pray. Well, what better idea do you have to deal with your situation? And then we come to church and we sit there like we've been hogtied and uh, gagged in our mouths and won't open up and give God praise because we feel in some type of way. But the psalmist says, I got a free will praise. I got a free will offering which is coming out of my mouth. That the enemy, as he says, that they have cords around me, the enemy might tie my hands, the enemy might tie my feet, but the enemy will not shut my mouth because out of my mouth I have life and death and he that eateth it shall eat the fruit thereof. He that loveth it shall eat the fruit thereof. And so when I understand that it is the power of my mouth that can get me out of the situation that I find myself in, the psalmist says that you ain't got to worry about this, God. I, I may not have money to give you. Uh, I may not have uh, many skills or competencies to bring to you right now, but the one thing I always have is a right now praise. In the midst of my situation, I'm going to praise you. In the midst of my hardship, I'm going to praise you. In the midst of my adversity, I'm going to praise you. In the midst of my hardship, I'm going to praise the Lord. Somebody say a right now praise. See, I'm going to praise him right now just to make the devil mad. Even if I don't feel like giving God praise, even if I don't want to give God praise, I so dislike the devil that I do it just to make him mad. It may not even be to make God glad, but I'll give God praise just to make the devil mad because I hate him more than I hate the affliction that I'm going through because I know he's trying to use it to stop me from becoming all that God created me to be. And so he says, Lord, Lord, receive my prayer. 
receive my praise. I'm opening my mouth to you because I want you to know what's in my heart. I am releasing out of my heart what I want you to hear in your ear. I want you to know what my needs are, but I also want you to know that I acknowledge and reverence who you are because I trust you. And because I trust you, I can praise you in spite of whatever is happening in my life. Number three, Brother Ron, he says, teach me your laws. He, he says, revive me, receive my prayers and praise, and then teach me. Y'all missed that. See, see, I need you, Lord, first to quicken me because uh, I, I'm, I'm just holding on, but, but once you quicken me, then my prayer is going to be invigorated. My, my praise is going to be taken to the next level, and then I need you to teach me. To teach has the idea of training as well as educating because I'm in an affliction. I'm in oppression. I'm in suffering, so I need from the word, the lamp and the light, watch this, to train me how to manage my affliction. Because if you're not going to remove it and your grace is sufficient for me, then I need you to make your strength perfect in my weakness. I need you to teach me how to handle this adversity. If I can't go out and I have to stay in, if I can't come out, because you're waiting to bring me through, then while I'm in it, I got to know how to thrive in a dry place. The Bible says that Isaac sowed in a famine and received a hundredfold return, a hundredfold harvest. In other words, my affliction is my condition, but my condition doesn't determine my destiny. And so God can cause me to prosper in a dry place. He can feed me manna in a wilderness. He can give me water from a rock in a weary land if I take the time for him to train me that it's not about your condition, it's not about your situation, but it's about the revelation of the I am in your experience. You're sick in your body, and I'm not taking it away. I am your healer. You are thirsty and need something to drink. I am the living water. You're hungry and you need something to eat. I am the living bread. And so, Lord, I need you to train me and I need you to educate me because you want me to go to a new level. This experience of affliction that I am going through is my tutor because I'm going to a new level and I'm going to a greater dimension. And this affliction is doing nothing but preparing me for what's in store for me. And so I have to learn how to stay here so that I can excel there. Oh, that's good stuff. I, I have to learn here so that I can go to the next level. I, I, I'm lightweight, but, but I want to make it to heavyweight, but I can't get to heavyweight until I've mastered fighting on the lightweight level. And so your affliction is just preparation for promotion to the next level. Somebody type that in. Preparation for promotion. Number four, I feel the Holy Ghost. We must remain faithful to God's word. Let's look at 109 and 110. We must remain faithful to God's word. My soul is continually in my hand, yet do I not forget thy law. The wicked have laid a snare for me, Yet I erred not from thy precepts. Ah, oh, that's good stuff right there. We cannot waver from the truth of the scriptures. We cannot waver from the truth of the scriptures. The psalmist's life was in constant danger. His soul, watch this, was in his hand. In other words, his life was constantly exposed. If, if, if your soul, and you're walking around with your soul, which is your life, your nefesh, Abraham 
Adam became a living nefesh, if your life is in your hands, somebody can take it. So somebody can injure it. And so he's saying, Lord, I'm exposed in this affliction. Everything seems to be gunning for me. My, my life is in danger. My sanity is in danger. My emotional well-being is in danger. And he's saying, I need you to see that I'm in constant danger. And despite the danger in his life, the psalmist was not deterred from remembering God's law. He says, Lord, I'm exposed here. I, I just want you to know I have some vulnerabilities, but I have not forgotten your law. To forget is not simply failing to remember God's law, but it often implies an appropriate action that one is moved to take. That's good stuff. See, see when he says, Lord, my, my, my life is exposed and I'm trusting you with my life, but I'm carrying it around like a cell phone. I'm, I'm, I'm walking around with my life, my soul, like a cheeseburger in my hand, but I have not forgot. In other words, despite what I'm going through, I have not forgot what you instructed me to do in situations like this. I, 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 it's, it's not that I only cognitively remember, but it means that before I act, I recall what God said. Because sometimes we, we want to take matters into our own hand. We, we forget about the expectation and we forget about the promise and we start acting based upon what we think God should have did or what we want God to do. But the psalmist says, despite the vulnerability that I have, despite the exposures that I have, I made sure that I maintained obedience to your word. Watch this, because we cannot wonder from our trust in the scriptures. His life was in danger from the ungodly who laid traps for him. Verse 85, the proud dug pits for him. In verse 95, the wicked hid in waiting for him to destroy him. So he's saying, I'm walking around here but I did not wander in spite of my danger. They are digging ditches for me to fall in. That's why I need the lamp and the light. They, they are hiding, waiting for me to come so they can jump me, but that's why I got the lamp and the light. Uh, what, one, uh, the NIDOT, the New International Dictionary of the Old Testament Theology and Exegesis, we call it NIDOT for short, says that a snare for a snare to be effective, it needs to be attached to a sapling or a light branch and set across a game track in such a way that when the animal puts its foot or neck into the trap or snare, the sapling springs back and the noose is pulled tight. In other words, the psalmist is saying that they're laying traps and snares for me and they've covered up the pit. So here I am walking down the road and they're waiting on me to take the wrong step so that the snare can grab my leg and catch me or so that I can stick my head in something and it snaps around my neck. But because your word is a lamp and a light, you expose every ditch. You expose their shadows while they're hiding because I got the word lighting my path. And so God will show you the setup that the enemy has for you even while they're plotting and planning it. You see who they're hanging out with. You see it in slow motion and you like, like, are you really thinking I'm that stupid to fall for the trap you're setting? But because God has given me light and he's protected me, he says, watch this. They've laid traps for me, but he doesn't wander from God's precepts. The precepts are the covenantal responsibilities that God places on his people. Now you got to get this, because here I think I might have wrote that for the psalmist, or at least he had me in mind. He's saying 
these no down, low down, no good dirty bums are trying to off me. They're trying to cause me to fall in a ditch. They trying to bust me upside my head with something without me knowing it. And Lord, I was really tempted. <laughs> I was really tempted to, to fight back. You know, I, I was really tempted to go down there with my two by four and start cracking some skulls. I, I was about to take my heater with me and let them know that it ain't popping off around here. But 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 I didn't wander. I, I, I didn't wander, Lord, because your precepts, your your commands, your instructions to me are my responsibility because I'm in relationship with you. I, I, I really want to still on them in the face, Lord, but but I got to love my enemies. I, I, I really, Lord, want to do them in, but vengeance is mine, saith the Lord. So I got to follow the covenantal responsibility of your word, even though I want to say, God, can you close your eyes for a good five minutes? I'm going to go out here in the back alley, take care of a little business, and then you can turn back around and we can be square again. But, but the psalmist says, despite what I really wanted to do, and I could handle it, I did not wander from your precepts. Then number five, Brother Vincent, we must take ownership of God's word. We must take ownership of God's word. 111 and 112, Psalm 119. Thy testimonies have I taken as a heritage forever. For they are the rejoicing of my heart. I have inclined mine heart to perform thy statutes always, even unto the end. We are to cherish God's word in our hearts. We are to cherish his word in our hearts. The psalmist had received God's regulations as his everlasting inheritance. This is good stuff here. I, I want you to see why he is so enamored with God's word and by extension God himself because he's received God's word as an inheritance. He says, I have taken your testimonies. And testimonies is just a synonym for the word of God, precepts, all of the words we've been reading here, they're just primarily synonyms. There are distinctions, but even the commentaries will tell you in Psalm 119, they are pretty much synonymous. And he receives these regulations, which testimonies are, as his everlasting inheritance. To take is to receive as a permanent possession. So he's saying to us and saying to God, but to us, that God's word is an inheritance. That is not just a book to read. <laughs> it's not just a novel. It's not just a wisdom book. It's not just a story about people who did extraordinary feats. It's not just a book on religion. It's not just a book about managing money. It's not just a book about marriage. It's not just a book about raising your kids. It's not just a book about leadership development, though all of those things are in the Bible. But it is the legacy and heritage of a people. We are God's children. We are part of God's kingdom and we are part of a heritage of generations of children of God who have been in covenant relationship with him. In other words, when I read the story of Abraham, I am reading the story of my spiritual ancestor. When, when I read the story of David, I am reading the story of one of my spiritual ancestors. When I read the story of Paul, I am reading the story of one of my spiritual ancestors. And throughout the line of time, we see a legacy and a tradition of living and lifestyle that we have become a part of. And so he says, Lord, when I read the word, it is 
an inheritance. It, it is a heritage that I am receiving. It is something greater than anything I can receive in the world because it is your legacy and it has become my legacy because I have taken it. I have received it and made it my heritage forever. Regarding the testimonies, Willem Van Gimmeren states, and I quote, the word testimony occurs in the idiomatic usage, the two tablets of the testimony, and the ark of the testimony. The tablets and the ark were symbols of the covenant relationship, and his testimony is often synonymous with covenant. He, here's with what Van Gemmeren is saying. He's saying that during the time of the Old Testament, which is what we're reading, they had the two tablets of the testimony, which we call the Ten Commandments. God wrote them on two tablets of stone, and that was his covenant with Israel. That was his testimony of his relationship with Israel. And they had the Ark of the Testimony, or what we refer to as the Ark of the Covenant, which was and represented the presence of God with Israel. And so the ark was nothing in and of itself, but it represented God's presence. So in the Ten Commandments, the two tablets of stone, and in the Ark of the Covenant, it was representative or symbolic of their covenant with God. So today, New Testament church, our symbols of our covenant with God, our symbols of testimony, our baptism and communion. When we are baptized, it symbolizes our union and covenant with Jesus. Every time we take Holy Communion over the Lord's Supper, it symbolizes our spiritual union with Jesus and with one another. And so when we take communion, we should always have in our mind, this is a sign, we call them ordinances. There's only two, baptism and communion, the Lord's Supper. They are reminders of our covenant with God. And so we are always thinking about what God has done for us in the person of Jesus in baptism and in Holy Communion. Sister Mary, we are to commit our hearts to live out the decrees of God's word. The psalmist had determined in his heart to perform what God required of him. He says, I have inclined mine heart. Look, look at how he makes all this personal. Your word is the rejoicing of my heart. And now he says, I have inclined my heart to perform your statutes. To incline is to turn in the direction of. If I'm going to commit myself and devote myself to living out God's word, my heart has to be turned toward God. If I am going to live out what he is pouring in, then my heart has to be inclined to him. Not my head, but my heart, because my head will follow my heart. If my heart turns, my head has to go with my heart because it is focusing and looking toward God. And the psalmist says earlier, your word have I hid in my heart that I might not sin against you. So if I can get this in here, then it shows God that I'm committed to him because I'm going to lead with my heart. I'm not going to lead with my head because my head will say, Isaac, you need to fix this yourself. But my heart will say, trust in the Lord with all thy heart and lean not to thy own understanding and all thy ways acknowledge him and he will, with the lamp and the light, direct your path. The psalmist was going to incline his heart to God at all times and for the rest of his life. Not just in this situation. Because see, we are situationally aware when it comes to God. We say, God, these are the things you can handle and these are the things that I'm going to handle. 
So we give certain things to God based on the situation. But the psalmist says, always I'm going to do this. Until the end, I'm going to do this. In every situation, he was going to do what God required of him. My affliction is included in every situation. Whatever you're going through right now is included in the always until the end. And so, like this psalmist, we have to have a commitment and a conviction in the midst of our affliction. Because remember, the, when we read in the opening, he said that our preferences can change, but if I have a conviction, they will not change. And what God wants us to have tonight is not a preference. I prefer to do the right thing. No, God is saying you have to be convicted to do the right thing. Our conviction as we get to the big idea, I had to wrap a bow around this. Our conviction in the truthfulness and trustworthiness of God's word is tested during times of affliction. But when we understand the character of God who gave us the scriptures, we can find hope and courage in difficult situations. See, what it boils down to is the character of God. Do you trust God's character or do you don't? Do you trust God's faithfulness or don't you? <laughs> do you trust God's love for you or don't you? Do you trust that God is all powerful? Do you trust that God is all knowing? Do you trust that God is everywhere? Do you trust that God will never leave you nor forsake you? If you trust and believe it to be true, then the affliction should not disrupt your faith. It should not disturb your relationship with him. Yes, it may cause you to be discomforted, but discomfort and disruption are two totally different things. I don't feel comfortable, but my faith my trust, my confidence, my commitment, and my conviction are not disturbed. So here's the application question. What is currently challenging your conviction? What is currently challenging your conviction? It's not a judgment on you. This is a being open and honest with us. The thing I love about the Psalms is they help me know I'm not crazy. They are really people's private journals that we get to read to understand psychologically, to understand emotionally or affectively, and to understand physically and spiritually the human condition and the human experience as a child of God. Because typically we read about Moses and we read about David and we read about Jerubabel. But here it's like somebody said, look, David left his journal open. Look at what David was going through. Asaph, he must have been in a hurry and he left some papers on his desk and we get to see Asaph's private journal. That's what these are. And so if they went through and they wrote it as an expression of the victory they got, we're reading people going through struggle, but who came out on the other end. And so these Psalms are songs of celebration. It was rough when they went through, but they're on the other side of it now. And so what they're saying to us and what God is saying to us through them is you can make it. I'm faithful, I'm trustworthy, I'm true, if you maintain your conviction and your commitment. So here's the challenge as I close. Read Psalm 119, 105 through 12, and identify one expression of the psalmist's conviction that you need to incorporate 
into your life. Sister Lenora, Eunice, Esther, read this again, those eight verses, and identify one expression. We looked at five of the psalmist's conviction that you need to incorporate during this time of affliction in your life. These are principles that he has handed down to us to help us to maintain our conviction in affliction. Can the church say amen? And I want to pray with you. I'm going to do the altar call in a minute, but the Lord is pressing on me to pray. So let me pray with you. And uh, Brother Paul, you can go ahead and play the, uh, the music, please. Lord, we thank you and we honor and we bless you tonight for your word. We thank you that no matter what affliction, what suffering, what oppression is happening in our life right now, that you've already promised us the victory and so we live our life with expectation, knowing that you will bring us out. God, we pray for everyone who is watching this Bible study right now and who will watch it later, that you would encourage them, Lord, to continue to fight the good fight of faith, to lay hold of eternal life, to not be weary in well-doing, knowing that in due season we will reap if we faint not. So, Lord, quicken us. Lord, receive our prayer and our praise. And, Lord, teach us, hallelujah, what we must do in this season in order to be pleasing in your sight and we give your name, the honor and the glory and the praise in Jesus' name. Give God a hand clap of praise in the chat and comment section. And if you're watching and you have not given your life to Jesus Christ, there is no greater time, there's no greater opportunity than right now to give your life to Jesus. Because the Bible lets us know that he sent his son to bear our afflictions, to, to suffer our oppression so that we would be liberated, that we would be set free, that we would be victorious no matter what happens in our life. Because the Bible lets us know that many are the afflictions of those who are in a relationship with God, but God, because he is faithful, God, because he is trustworthy, God, because he is true, delivers us out of each and every affliction. And so he doesn't say they won't come, but he does say, I'll deliver you out of them. And until I deliver you, I'll sustain you in it because you can't be delivered out unless you survive it. And so God not only wants you to survive, he wants you to thrive. And so we extend to you, and there should be a number on your screen or some information on your screen for you to call to let us know that you want to give your life to Jesus. So if you're there and if God has touched your heart, call us and say, I want to give my life to Jesus, that I want to have conviction in affliction, that I want to be able to have the same story, the, the same outcome that this psalmist had. So I can tell my friends, I can tell my family what God has done in my life. Call that number. Receive Christ into your heart. Even now, all you have to say is, Lord, I believe that you sent your son Jesus to die for my sins that he rose again on the third day, and that because he lives, I too can have life and be in a covenant, in a obligated relationship with you. And God bless you and keep you. And we will say a prayer at the end for you that God will continue to bless you and be with you. And we encourage you to come this Sunday to worship with us at 9, 10, or 11, 40 a.m., to be baptized in Jesus' name, filled with his precious gift of the Holy Spirit. It's now offering time at the Apostolic Church of God. Can we say amen? I hope you didn't get off before we received our offering. 
Uh, the psalmist says, Lord, receive my free will offering. And we want to make sure uh, that you are bringing God a free will offering. You can give digitally by text to give. Those are the numbers on your screen right now. You can also give at the church's website, acog-chicago.org. I have my offering here with me tonight, and I'm going to walk to the uh, receptacle by the uh, security guard's desk and, and put uh, my offering in tonight. Just a couple of announcements before I pray for the offering and pray for those who have given their life to Jesus Christ and receive our benediction. One, uh, don't forget that this Sunday is the last Sunday service of the year. I know it's the day after Christmas, but y'all, this is the last Sunday of 2021. You got to show your face in the place. You, you, you got to be here on Sunday. Uh, we got to raise the roof. We got to send this year out with a bang because New Year Eve service will be virtual. So this really, for all intents and purposes, is the last service of the year. Uh, that we will have in this building. And so come on out, press your way, uh, and be in the house. Type in there, I'm going to be in the house on Sunday. But also on uh, New Year's Eve, we will have our virtual New Year's Eve service, and it will air at 7 p.m. and again at 10 p.m. Uh, you know, some of us you know, we go to bed early now. We, we can't hang and kick it like we used to. Uh, so for those of us who go to bed a little earlier, we will have the broadcast of the New Year's Eve service at 7 p.m. And then for those of you who are uh, night owls, you can watch it at 10 p.m. And it's wonderful. I think you're going to enjoy it. There's going to be some things in there that I think uh, you will be surprised to see. And we expect a wonderful time in the Lord. And uh, just want to give a few uh, families for us to remember in terms of bereavement. One, uh, Sister uh, Veda Lang, the mother of Brother Jeffrey Lang, our bass player. Her services will be here at the church on Wednesday, December 29th. Wake at 1030, funeral at 11. And then on January 4th. In the new year, Evangelist Martha Williams, mother of Sister Monique and Crystal Williams, uh, her services will be here, 1030 wake, 11 o'clock funeral. And then uh, also the family of Evangelist Linda Berry, her husband passed away, and the funeral arrangements are pending. Now let us pray for the offering, pray for those who receive Christ, and I will pronounce the priestly blessing over you for the benediction. Father, we thank you now for all that you have done. We thank you for the word that you have stirred in our hearts, and we thank you, Lord, for all who have received Christ and given their lives to you. We pray that you will fill them with the precious gift of your Holy Spirit based upon their confession of faith and confidence in the blessed word of God. We pray, Lord, that you will receive tonight's offering and tithe that we are bringing unto you. We ask God that you will multiply it 100 fold for the use of your kingdom, for the perfecting of the saints, for the work of the ministry, so that the body of Christ is edified. And we pray also, Lord, that you will return it back to us 100 fold for our own personal use. Lord, now I pray that you will bless us and keep us, that you will cause your face to shine upon us and be gracious unto us, that you would lift up your countenance upon us and give us peace in Jesus' name. God bless you. I will see each and every one of you this Sunday in the house. God bless you. Have a Merry Christmas. This telecast is copyrighted by the Apostolic Church of God for the private use of our audience. Any other use of this telecast, pictures, descriptions, or accounts of the church service without consent from the Apostolic Church of God is prohibited.